Hey everyone, we're back for a 23rd episode of Ask GN, and this is the series where if you have questions about hardware, technology, news, whatever, post them below. We'll try to get to it for the next video. This one we're doing in the middle of a thunderstorm, so I apologize if there's some background noise while I'm talking here, but let's get into the first question. Is from Lucretius22. I'm not sure if that name disgusts me or not. Is there any point to changing the core clock of a modern GPU for overclocking as opposed to just increasing the power target and or temperature limit? Uh, since with GPU boost, the card will overclock as far as it can anyway. <clears throat> the shorter answer to this is yes. It depends on what you're doing. So uh, for the RX 480 as an example, we tested this where because the uh, if you just increase the power target, it's still got a range. So it's saying I'm going to stay between X megahertz and Y megahertz, where X and Y might be something like, uh, off the top of my head, I, don't, I think 12, 1100, 1200 to 1300 almost, depending on what kind of offset you configure. But it's got a range. And so if you just increase the power target and don't touch anything else on something like the RX 480, what will happen is it'll push as high as it can when it can, and then when it feels uh, as if some sort of thermal threshold is being hit, it'll throttle back. And so you lose some frames there, you potentially introduce uh, some low 1% or 0.1% low frame rates, which impacts your frame times, which creates stuttering. So the way to avoid that would be to go in there and also configure a higher fan speed or a fan speed curve, or manually configure the clock rate and set it to be something more stable and consistent or restrict the range of that clock rate. So that's one reason. On NVIDIA cards like the GTX 1080, it's a similar answer. They had that voltage frequency curve these days that was new with Boost 3.0. Uh, Boost 3.0 and AMD's newest version of Boost are both pretty complex in the way they function versus previously. But increasing the power target certainly will do a bit for you. It'll sustain the high end of the configured clock rate for longer, uh, depending on, because it, it also increases the temperature limit in step. So it increases the two together. So by increasing the temperature limit and the power target limit, you're removing or reducing uh, some mitigating factors, two variables that could throttle back the clock rate. So you'll sustain a higher overall clock, but uh, you'll get a bit just from doing the percentage offset. I would recommend manually overclocking in general just as good practice because you'll get more out of it and you can kind of fine tune where the, the limits are. Next question is from Matt Sibiu, Sibiu four days ago, who says, not sure if you will know much about this, but here's a question. With doing a more budget system for CAD type software, PTC, Creo specifically, would you recommend buying the cheaper GeForce card uh, or, or would the cheaper GeForce card be fine compared to getting a Quadro card? The projects right now are small mechanical parts. So something like CAD, computer-aided design or drafting, uh, I'm not an expert in, but I, I can give you some advice based on personal experience with it to some extent. Uh, with CAD software and with render software like Premiere, or uh, if you're working with SolidWorks, Blender, anything like that, one thing you'll want to check is, first of all, is the software CUDA or OpenCL accelerated? If it's OpenCL and, and it's supported well, then AMD cards can work pretty well with it. If it's CUDA accelerated, then obviously you go NVIDIA. And you, for, for professional or production use cases, you really want to buy your card based on what your software will support in terms of acceleration on the GPU, on the hardware side, because you don't want to push all that on the CPU. So buy your card based on that. If it's CUDA, let's say it's CUDA accelerated, I don't know if that's the case for PTC Creo specifically, but if it's CUDA accelerated, you're buying an NVIDIA card. Uh, if it's OpenCL, maybe consider AMD, but NVIDIA card, Quadro may, Quadro will work, but it's always going to be more expensive than a GeForce card, which I guess is where this question comes from. So as an example, for Adobe Premiere, we use GeForce cards and even though Quadro would kind of work a bit better, the price offset isn't worth it to us. So we just use GeForce. You can even use multiple of them if you want. If the software supports multi-GPU, it doesn't need to be over an SLI bridge, just multi-GPU through MDA. Um, so a GeForce can be as good or comparable to Quadro, but you'll want to check, uh, will the software specifically support GeForce? and then look around for benchmarks online. Unfortunately, I'm not an expert in that area. One thing I will say for Adobe software 
in the past, we've had to uh, go into TXT files and configuration files and add the card that we're using. So, for example, in CS5, you have to go into a TXT file, add in GeForce GTX 980 or 780 or whatever, and at that point, it will use that card for acceleration. Up until that point, it would only detect and use certain Quadro cards. Uh, so you may have to change your software's configuration files to specifically detect and call a GTX card. And obviously, the software needs to support that at some level as well. So basically, the answer is, unfortunately, you're going to have to do some more research. But uh, GTX can work as well or close enough uh, to a Quadro card and performance where it may be worth buying just because it's cheaper, especially if it supports multi-GPU. Next question is from Miguel Felix, who says, so I'm curious, how much of an improvement can you expect from each release of drivers from NVIDIA or AMD? Would it be noticeable in terms of FPS? Yes, it would be noticeable in terms of FPS. We have tested some of this. Uh, a good example that we tested recently and is published was when Doom came out before Vulkan. Doom came out with OpenGL only, and the AMD R9 390X we tested had pretty bad performance. I think it was comparable to a GTX 960, which should never be the case. And so AMD push drivers, that Im improved performance so much, I think it was, uh, it was 25 or 30% performance increase in FPS. So it improved it so much that it outpaced the 960, and I think, going from memory, was tied close to whatever with the 970. So you can definitely expect bigger improvements than a zero FPS noticeable gain. Uh, depends on the driver update, depends on the game. So a driver update doesn't just do a blanket increase in performance for all games. It will specifically target certain games, target elements of that game, whether it's post FX processing or texture or batch processing or whatever. Whatever the game is doing in bulk, AMD and NVIDIA will tune for that, uh, that game specifically and then you get a performance improvement. There's no real generally you can expect X percent, but uh, I've seen as much as 30 percent and I've seen as low as 1 percent. So definitely a range. Next question, Zelastar says, about these AIO GPUs, that's all in one for those who don't know, with the uh, liquid cooler. About these AIO GPUs, I've experienced issues with an AIO CPU cooler which need topped up after only six months due to air bubbles getting caught in the pump. What is the, and causing noise, what is the situation if this needs to be done with one of these AIO GPUs that don't have a fill port? So no, that's correct. These generally an AIO by a sort of nature of, of what it is, an all-in-one, it will not have a fill port. It's not meant really to be an open loop system that you're filling and maintaining. It's supposed to be easily deployable. You use it for like five years and then you throw it out and get something else with your new computer. Uh, so they are not meant to be refilled. And that does mean that they have uh, some advantages over open loops, one is time, two is price, those are the big ones, but they also have a bio side in them, uh, which I forget what it is off the top of my head, but they have a bio side in them, and that, uh, that helps make sure there's no bacteria buildup, which you will sometimes get in open loops if you don't also put some of that chemical in, which you, you can buy it from Lowe's or something. But, uh, so that's, those are the advantages. Now, in terms of topping them off, you can't do that with these AIOs, but you shouldn't need to. The only reason you get air bubbles with noise that I can think of uh, as on a consistent basis would be if you install the radiator upside down. So the recommended installation for almost all radiators I've ever worked with, uh, let's say you're, you've got a case here, and I've actually got one here. <laughs> so we just built this for that video that was countering the motherboard article. And if you mount your radiator in the back of the case, in the rear fan slot, what's going on? Then um, basically you get what's in this case here. So you see I have the tubes down here. That's where you want them. If you install this with the tubes at the top of a rear mounted or vertical radiator front mounted, uh, tubes at the top can, it makes the pump work harder. The pump is now pulling the, the liquid down, uh, and that can cause air to enter the sort of the system. Uh, and we talked to Rob Teller from Ace Tech about this, but it's a real problem, it causes air bubbles, and that can create the noise you're talking about. So just install it correctly, and it shouldn't really be a problem. Next question is from 
Remus, or Remus, King of Rome, who says, serious question, I'm hearing the, I've heard that before, I'm hearing the 490 might be two 480s in one card. Is that possible? If so, it doesn't really fix the crossfire issue of old games not using multiple GPUs. So what's the point? Um, so the first question, is it possible? Yes, you can definitely put two GPUs on one card and it's been done several times. Some of the old NVIDIA 90 series, so I think the 690 maybe was one of them recently, 590. Those were two GPU cards. So it's two GPUs on one PCB and then they share the RAM or they have two separate, uh, I should say, separate stacks of RAM. So it, it might be labeled as, for example, and they did this, AMD did this with the Fire Pro, might be labeled as like 12 or 16 gigabytes of VRAM, but it's still independent, effectively banks for each GPU. But yeah, it's possible. And then the next question was, doesn't fix the Crossfire issue. Any issues you have with Crossfire or SLI, you will pretty much also have with a dual GPU single card because it's still going to behave the same. Uh, it needs to be tasked independently or correctly by the developers of the game. Anything that's got interdependent frames like post effects and things like that will be uh, more difficult for SLI and Crossfire configurations to resolve. And that includes multi GPU single cards. Um, as for the 490 specifically, I honestly haven't looked at any, any rumors. I don't know anything about what it's supposed to be. But if it is two RX 480s, then uh, that would basically just be two of the Ellesmere chips on a single card, which AMD has done in the past, and it's normally been in the 90 series. So that seems like a reasonable potential assumption. And it would be more powerful. You would get the same performance. If you look at our RX 480 Crossfire benchmark, it would be almost the same performance with one potential change to that. A potential change would be you're forcing a lot more data potentially through the PCIe slot. So when you're pushing all this extra, based because you're dual processing, you're doing AFR, so it's one frame per GPU. So that's more, uh, in theory, double the, the frame output from a single card. Not necessarily how it works in real life, but that's the idea. So when you increase the bandwidth and push it all through one port, there is a chance that you lose some performance as opposed to two RX 480s that have the exact same clock rate and everything in Crossfire. So keep that in mind. But uh, with a dual GPU single card, Normally there's either a price benefit or uh, you can just get two of them and now you have four cards that only take two slots. So that's okay, I guess, depending on what you're trying to do. Hopefully that answers that. But uh, yeah, so last video at the end, we edited in the 50,000 thing. Thank you all for helping us reach 50,000 subscribers. We are already on the way, well on the way to 60,000. So as always, subscribe, tell your friends to watch. Patreon link to post the video if you want to help us out directly. I'll see you all next time.